So we have after food consumption of a rich food, rich food. When you talk about rich, we are talking about a food that is high, highly concentrated with fats, okay, or highly concentrated with oil. So there was nausea and heart pain, and there it was stetoria. Indonesia means stool that has a lot of fat. So this condition might be caused by, and you know that what helps in the digestion of fat or in the of fat as well is uh, bowel, is bowel. So definitely when this bowel is deficient, what happens? It means that the fat will not do it, will not undergo a multiplication for it to be digested. So it will come down as pieces or as a stool, as a stool, it will look like grease or oily. So you can have a called oily stool, also known as stetoria. So here, we are thinking of, of bile acid deficiency. Bile acid deficiency. All right. We have galactosemia. So galactosemia is your glue, is revealed. Concentration of glucose in the blood is not considerably changed. What deficiency has this patient? So we're talking about galactosemia, galactosemia. What then is a galactosemia? A galactosemia is a genetic uh, metabolic disorder that affects an individual's ability to metabolize the sugar galactose. galactose. So in this patient, the person cannot metabolize with galactose. galactose, galactose. And usually, the enzyme that is involved in its metabolism or in its pathway is the galactose one. Is the galactose one phosphate the the transferase? Is the galactose one phosphate the transferase? Galactose one phosphate the transferase. So this is the enzyme that is involved in the metabolism of what galactose or galactose, galactose, galactose. That is the enzyme that is involved. So when this enzyme is deficient, usually it can be through childhood or it can be congenital, congenital, congenital. So when it happens like that, it means this patient cannot metabolize galactose, galactose. So here we are thinking of, what? of A as our likely answer. A as our likely answer. All right. So we have fatty of phosphates is disordered due to fat infiltration in the liver. When we say fat infiltration in the liver, we are referring to what? Hepatic steatosis. Hepatic steatosis. Steatosis means S T E A T O S I S. Steatosis. Hepatic. That means fat in the liver. That's the term that is given to it. Fat in the liver means what? Hepatic steatosis. Hepatic steatosis. And this occurs when there's a deficiency. It occurs when there is a deficiency of choline. Choline. It occurs when there's a deficiency of what? Choline. That is C-H-O-L-I-N-E. Deficiency of choline, choline, and when there's a deficiency of choline, automatically it means there'll be a deficiency in methionine. There will be a deficiency in methionine because they are all involved in the pathway. In the pathway, they are all involved in the pathway. So like I said, fatty liver means what? Hepatic steatosis, hepatic steatosis, and it occurs when there's no or a deprived choline, a deprived choline, deprived choline. And choline is also involved or is involved in the metabolism of methionine, methionine, methionine. So if there's no choline, it means there can be what? Methionine. And that's over here, they say, well, indicate which substance, indicate which of the presented substance can enhance the process of what? Methylation during phosphol uh, phospholipase synthesis. During phospholipase synthesis. 
So this is a question about what? Of the metonym. You are thinking of what? Of the metonym. For metonym is also involved in what? Methylation. Methylation. So here, we're talking about what? Of B. Of B. But here, in this case, it is deficient. It is deficient. And that's why there's a fat in the liver. So here, we are thinking of metonym. Metonym. All right. Characteristic sign of glycogenosis. Glycogenosis is pain muscle during physical work. Blood examination reveals hypoglycemia. What is the congenital deficiency? What is the congenital deficiency? So glycogenosis in pain is glycogen storage disease. Glycogen storage disease. When we say glycogen. That is how glucose are being stored. Good. That's how glucose are being stored in the liver. So we're talking about what? It's deficiency. We're talking about its diseases. So there could be a problem with the storage of what? Of glucose inside the liver. And that term is called glycogenosis or glycogen storage disease. Glycogen storage disease. Now, there are a lot of types of glycogen storage disease but of course we don't have that time to speak a whole topic or to talk about a whole topic to talk about a whole topic however however when we're having this kind of pain in the muscle during physical activity we are referring to type 5 we are referring to type 5 we have the von Keck. don't worry you let me not go into all this thing. but then if you have time Kindly try and go through all of these uh, glycogen storage diseases. But over here, we are referring to the type 5. And in type 5, we have deficiency of glycogen phosphorylase. Glycogen phosphorylase. Glycogen phosphorylase. So here, we are thinking of, of E as our answer. Glycogen phosphorylase. Glycogen phosphorylase. All of these things are all involved. So look for the different, different, different types. You have type one, type two, type three, type four, MacAdil, all these things. Look for them. But this is a type five. This is type five. This is type five. All right. I made a video on YouTube. I think with these sort of questions, so you can try and watch my YouTube. I think I explained it in details over there. So try and get the video and get it on YouTube. The name is Medens. So go to YouTube, you see Medens. Just try and you see it over there, Medens. All right, so let's continue. We have an infant has apparent diarrhea resulting from improper feeding. One of the main diarrhea effects is plentiful excretion of sodium bicarbonate. What form of acid base balance can you see? So over here, you have to know the difference between acidosis and alkalosis. You need to know the difference between acidosis and alkalosis. When we say acidosis, it means there's more uh, there's more ions in the body. That's what acidosis or hydrogen ion concentration is high. Hydrogen ion concentration is high. That's what happens. Acidosis. So it comes of acidic. Now, alkalosis means what? It's the opposite, where we have what? Very low calcium, uh, so very low ion or hydrogen ions in the body. As a result, alkalinity is what? It's high. Or the pH becomes what? High. Low pH means there's high uh, hydrogen concentration. And then high pH means there's, uh, there's low hydrogen uh, ions present. Now, they are saying that this patient is what is creating what sodium bicarbonate, sodium bicarbonate, sodium bicarbonate. Now, you know that sodium bicarbonate are actually what alkaline, sodium bicarbonate are what alkaline. So, imagine you are excreting all the alkaline from the body. What happens? It means your system becomes what acidic, it means your system becomes what acidic. And again, if you are vomiting, 
you know when you are vomiting, you read that your mouth is bitter. That means more acid is coming out of your mouth. More acid is coming out of your mouth. And if more acid is coming out of your mouth, what does it mean? It means that you're going to have what? Uh, alkalosis in your system. Alkalosis in your system. So please note the two. So when it comes to diarrhea, you are thinking of what? Acidosis. When it comes to vomiting, you are thinking of what? Alkalosis. So in this case, that we are thinking about diarrhea, what comes to mind? Of course, uh, metabolic work, acidosis, also known as excretory acidosis, excretory acidosis, because you are excreting it, so excretory acidosis or metabolic acidosis. Metabolic. The same mechanism is involved in the respiration. So if you are breathing in, you are breathing out, just know what is what the concentration of the ion and all of these things. All right. We have a methotrexate. So methotrexate inhibits DNA and RNA, right? It inhibits DNA and RNA. It is prescribed to, for the treatment of a malignant tumor, exactly. So in malignant tumor, there's a hyperproliferation. So now methotrexate will inhibit that proliferation, right? But the question now is that which, on which level does Methotrexate inhibit the synthesis of the nucleic acid, of the nucleic acid. So definitely, like I said, we are talking about DNA and what? RNA. So what comes to mind? Of course, mononucleotide synthesis. So it inhibits mononucleotide synthesis. So these are the porins and the, the pyramidins. The porins and the, the pyramidins. And these are involved, of course, in the synthesis of what? DNA and what? And RNA. DNA and RNA. So when they are inhibited, what it means is that DNA will not be produced, RNA will not be produced, protein will not be produced, and hence there will be no tumor or there will be reduction in the tumor formation. Reduction in the tumor formation. So over here, we're going for what? Mononucleotide for synthesis. And don't forget, mononucleotide are the basic structures of what? Of DNA and RNA. Aha. So please take note. Okay, so it's A. Good. We have RNA polymerase 2. It's blocked due to uh, amanitin poison. It disturbs, or what is the function of RNA polymerase? What is the function of RNA polymerase? So first of all, what is a polymerase? So a polymerase is simply an enzyme that synthesizes long chains of polymer or nucleic acid. It synthesizes long chain of polymer or nucleic acid. Now we have DNA polymerase, meaning it has to do with, with DNA, and we have what? RNA polymerase, meaning it has to do with what? RNA. RNA. And in RNA, we have uh, R RNA or rhizoboma RNA. We have messenger RNA and we have T RNA or transfer RNA. So the question now is among R, N, and T, what is the function for RNA polymerase 2? RNA polymerase 2. So please write this. RNA polymerase 1 deals with R, R, RNA or ribosoma RNA. That is polymerase 1. It deals with R. And a capital RNA. Now, in, uh, in polymerase 2, it deals with messenger RNA or mRNA. mRNA. Then in polymerase 3, it deals with tRNA or transfer RNA. So, again, since we are dealing with what polymerase 2, what comes to mind? Messenger RNA. So, your answer will be that. Will be A. If it's to be one, what comes to mind? Of course, ribosomal RNA or rRNA. If it's to be three, we are dealing with what? Transfer RNA. All right. We have pain along large nerve, large nervous stems, an increased amount of pyruvate. Pyruvate is increased. 
insufficiency of what vitamin can cause. So first of all, why would there be an increase in your pyruvate? That means that it's lacking some coenzyme to make it active. And you know pyruvate is involved in what we call PPP, that is pentose phosphate pathway. Pentose phosphate pathway. It uses pyruvate dehydrogen. It uses pyruvate dehydrogen. And pyruvate dehydrogen is a multi-enzyme system, but part of it has to do with what? Uh, or how do you call it? Uh, part of it has to do with a vitamin. Part of it has to do with a, a vitamin. That vitamin is vitamin B1. Vitamin B1. So it serves as a, as a co-enzyme. That's what timing, timing. Timing, time to so timing is a, a co factor. It's a co factor. Timing, pyrophosphate, co factor. It's a co factor that is present in pyruvate. So its absence will mean that the pyruvate is not active. So you can't function. So, a lot of as a result, you see it in urine, or a patient will be excreting it in the blood, or it will be found in the blood. In so basically, we are talking about vitamin B1. Why? Because it means the deficiency of what? Vitamin. Vitamin or timing. Sorry. Deficiency of timing. Timing. So here, the answer is A. We have a patient with encephalopathy was admitted to the neurological inpatient department. Correlation of increasing of encephalopathy and substance absorbed by the bloodstream in the intestine were revealed. What substance in the intestine can cause endotoxemia? So you're talking about encephalopathy, that is problem with the brain or a disease of the brain. A disease of the brain. And they are saying that this occurs as a result of what? Food substances in the intestine. Food substances in the intestine. So, usually, usually, when uh, we have undigested proteins, okay, when we have undigested proteins, they are usually broken down by, you know, intestine has microflora. So, these microflora act on undigested proteins and break it down into ammonia, which is not good for the brain. Break it down to phenols, indols, and amines. I repeat, it breaks down on digestive process into ammonia, phenols, D H E N O L S, phenols. Then we have indoles, I N D O L E S. Then we have what? Amines, A M I N E S. So these are the four. Uh, substances that undigested proteins are broken down by the microflora. So again, what and these are all not good for the brain. They are all not good for the brain. So the question is that from the four, which one of them can you see in this question? So what substance are we thinking about? Of course, indo, indo, indo. So your answer is what? D. Indo, indo. All right. Examination of a patient suffering from cancer of the nerve that revealed high rate of serotonin and hydroxyantranelic uh, acid. What amino acid are they talking about? So you must know what amino acid is involved in the pathway of serotonin in all those things. And what comes to mind? So basically, uh, hydroxy and tranelic acid is an intermediate in the metabolism of tryptophan. Tryptophan is an amino acid. It is, it is an intermediate in the metabolism of tryptophan. And also, serotonin is synthesized by tryptophan. Serotonin is synthesized by tryptophan. tryptophan. So here we are talking about what? Tetrophone. 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 
down to the SS. So if you do SS, then you see a lot of these things being present, being present. All right. So crypto fund is our guide on this question. All right. A mother consulted a doctor about her five-year-old child who developed erythema. Erythema is uh, like redness, okay? We have particular rash, so rash that are particular in nature, and we have itching under the influence of sun. So this is your clue for diagnosis. So those who intend to sun and then all of a sudden, they become very red, rash begin to itch their body and stuff like that. This is a deficiency disease or it's a congenital deficiency disease. It is a deficiency disease. Normally we call these kind of people uh, erythropoietic erythropoietic perforia. So called the congenital erythropoietic perforia. Congenital erythropoietic Per year. This is the name of the condition for people that go into the sun and start having redness of the skin, rashes, and stuff like that. And again, look at the look at what confirms it. The studies show that there is a decrease iron concentration, but increase in this excretion, increase in urocoprogenogen, one excretion. Do you understand? Then usually, uh, uroporphyrinogen is actually an isomer of uroporphyrinogen 3. It is an isomer for uroporphyrinogen 3. And usually, in this congenital erythropoietic uh, peculiar, that is what is what deficient. That enzyme is deficient. In other words, uroporphyrinogen 3 is deficient. Is deficient. So it's not able to use it. As a result, they are being worked. Why? Because they are being excreted. They are all being excreted. They are all being excreted. So this goes on to affect the bone marrow and the cells in the body. They treat the bone, every part of the body. They are affected or it is affected. It's affected. So here we are thinking of, of D as our answer. The retropoetic failure. Or congenital erythropoietic peripheria. All right. We have a three year old child with fever, fever, and was given aspirin. It resulted in intensified erythrocyte analysis. That means the breakdown of red blood cells, red blood cells, and usually. You must understand that red blood cells are protected by what we call uh, NADPH. NADPH. We've heard about it before. So it prevents oxidative reaction to the RBCs. You know, RBCs are very, very susceptible to all these sort of uh, hard drugs or high substances affecting them and breaking it down. So but they are protected. By what this NADPH, they are protected by this NADPH, and NADPH also depends on glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogen or G6PD. G6PD, I don't know if I've heard about it before, but G6PD can be inherited disorder. And when people inherit this disorder, especially in the newborn, they have uh, hemolysis and they begin to have a jaundice because when hemolysis, when red blood cells are broken down. A lot of what bilirubin will be released, and they are released, it will lead to what? It will lead to jaundice formation or yellow discoloration. Yellowish discoloration. So that is what happened. So in bit of that patient, he is suffering from the gene says PD deficiency. And G says PD deficiency is something that glucose phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. So here you are thinking of what? Of C, of C, of C, of C. So when this is deficient, that means the NADPH cannot function. Cannot function. When it cannot function, it can't, it can't protect the RBCs from harmful substances like aspirin. All right. 
we have black of a 12 year old boy with low concentration of uric acid and accumulation of xanthine and hypoxanthine. So, what defect is present in this patient? So, of course, we know that accumulation of uric acid is a, in the joint is called, is called gout. But in this case, there's nothing like that being present. There's nothing like that being present. However, the last two steps, okay, the last two steps in uric acid biosynthesis, the last two steps in the uric acid biosynthesis is characterized by xanthine oxidase. It is characterized by xanthine oxidase. Xanthine oxidase. Xanthine oxidase. So what it means is that if this enzyme is deficient, it means that uric acid cannot be what? Be synthesized. It cannot be synthesized. So there will be a reduction in the uric acid because that pathway to actually convert the substance to uric acid is no more working. That is the xanthine of today. It is no more. Working. So that means that there is no byproduct as the uric acid present. As a result, that's what happens. As a result, the xanthine and the acetylene will accumulate in the system. And with accumulate, of course, they were excreted out of the body. They were excreted out through the urine, through the urine. So here, we are talking about xanthine oxid, uh, oxidase. Xanthine oxidase. Xanthine oxidase. <laughs> All right. An increased amount of free fat acid is observed in the blood of patients with diabetes and mellitus. It can be caused by, look, this patient is talking from diabetes, and they are saying that there's free fatty acid. Free fatty acid. Now, when this somebody is having diabetes and mellitus, either two things, either insulin is not being produced or insulin is being produced, but they are not being absorbed by the tissues. So as a result, the body sees, uh, the body sees that it is lacking with glucose or it is lacking with energy. So it will now cause stimulation of what glucose from non-carbohydrate substances, non-carbohydrate substances through a process called what? gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis. That means the synthesis of glucose from non carbohydrate substances. Non carbohydrate substances. Now, of course, when you are studying this thing, that means that fats need to be broken down, uh, muscles need to be broken down, a whole lot of substances in the body will be broken down. As a result, there will be free fatty acid. So, this could be as a result of what? Increased activity of a tri, uh, triglycerolipase adipocytes or yeah, lipolysis, which is called lipolysis, lipolysis. So that's an activation of glucose from non carbohydrate substances, gluconeogenesis, gluconeogenesis. All right. We have a 36 year old female patient having a continuous history of progressive muscular dystrophy. That means destruction of, what? of the muscles, destruction of the, what? the muscles, destruction of the muscles, or the muscular dystrophy. So the muscles are undergoing what? degeneration and weakness. Generation and the marker for identifying this thing is what we call CPK or CT, also known as creatinine phosphokinase. Creatinine phosphokinase or creatine, actually, it's creatine, not creatinine, it's creatine phosphokinase. Creatine phosphokinase. And this one, when muscles are being broken down or are going through degeneration, you will say it's produced. So it can be in the heart, 
muzzles, any part, skeletal muzzles, whatever, when they're being damaged, you see this increase in the blood, in the blood. So here, we are talking of creatine phosphate kinase or CPK or CK. They all mean the same. They all mean the same. A patient is ill with diabetes mellitus that is accompanied by hyperglycemia over 70, over 70 on an empty stomach. The level of blood plasma proteins allows to estimate glycemia rate retrospectively. When we say retrospectively, that means for a period of one month or two months, what is the rate of the sugar in the blood? And you know that we know that glucose love to bind with proteins. Okay. Yes, so definitely. So how do you call it? Glucose, sorry, sugar. Yeah, glucose love to bind with hemoglobin. Sorry. Glucose love to bind with hemoglobin. They have affinity for, for hemoglobin. So usually if you want to check retrospectively, that means for a very long time ago, what was the rate of the how do you call it the glucose in the blood? You can determine it through a process called what? Glycated hemoglobin. Glycated hemoglobin. Glycated hemoglobin. Whereby the hemoglobin binds with what? With the glucose. So if you're able to check it, you can determine that if this person is really having diabetes mellitus or not, or it is diabetes mellitus chronic or not, you need to know that. So you use what? The glycated hemoglobin. Of course, fasting sugar says that it is high, so diabetes is confirmed. However, you want to know of the truth, if it is true or not, then you do what? The glycated hemoglobin. And of course, it has a ring that you must know. If it is more, if it's more than 6.5 percent, if it's more than 6.5 percent, that means this person is diabetic. Or if it's less, that means the person is not diabetic. The person is not diabetic. So please take note of that. All right. So here, the answer is A. We have a case of enterobiasis acrohen, the structure analog of vitamin B2 is administered. The synthesis disorder of which enzymes are this medicine? What they are trying to tell you that? What does vitamin B2 consist of? What does it, or how does it, uh, how does it react? Or how does it become active? Or how does it perform its function? That's what they're just telling you. Vitamin B12, the same as well, riboflavin, riboflavin, riboflavin. And of course, it has two major coenzymes that makes it active. Coenzymes, they are what? FAD, also known as flavin adenyl dinucleotide. Flavin adenyl Dinucleotide, that's what FDA. Then we have FMN, that is flavin mononucleotide. Flavin mononucleotide. So over here, I've mentioned two coenzymes, either FDA or FMN. FMN. So in this case, what do we have? We have the FDA. We have what? The FDA. So here, we're definitely going to the coenzyme FDA. Coenzyme FD. Coenzyme FD. All right. A 10 year old girl often experiences acute respiratory infection with multiple hemorrhages, hemorrhages, hemorrhages in places of close infection. That means anything that is scratching her, what happens? There's bleeding. So, what vitamin is deficient but vitamin is deficient of course you are thinking of ascorbic acid or vitamin C. vitamin c you are thinking about vitamin c or vitamin c is also involved in what in uh 
collagen formation, which present, which uh, stratifies the the layers of the skin. Where we have the uh, proline, the lysine, and all those kind of things. Okay, so over here, this is going to prevent the hemorrhage. This is going to prevent the hemorrhage. It's going to prevent hemorrhage. It's going to prevent hemorrhage. So here we are going for vitamin C or ascorbic acid. Ascorbic acid. Ascorbic. Acid. ascorbic. Don't remember. I hope you, from, you remember that I also told you that it helps in healing too. Apart from vitamin A, it also helps in healing. It also helps in healing because it's involved in collagen formation. Because it is involved in collagen formation. So here we are taking out of vitamin D. So vitamin C is of ascorbic acid. All right. Oh, oh look at this. It's a hydroxylation of endogenous substances in xenobiotics require a donor of proteins. Which of the following buttons can play in this role? I've told you already. Hydroxylation has to do with the vitamin C or ascorbic acid. Ascorbic acid, because it deals with uh, the collagen fibers. It deals with collagen fibers. It deals with collagen fibers. So here, we are thinking of it, vitamin C. Vitamin C. Vitamin C. All right. We have the formation of secondary mediator in obligatory in membrane in tracellular mechanism of hormones at point of the substance that is unable to be a secondary mediator. What this question is saying that identify all the secondary mediators and which one of them is not a secondary mediator. That's what the question is saying. So what it means that if you don't know what the secondary mediator is, definitely you can't tell your answer. So what it means by uh, secondary mediator is, for instance, when uh, oh, how do I put it? Listen, listen, you give a drug, okay? When you do it, when you give a drug, the drug is the primary mediator. But when it goes in, it's supposed to react or the mechanism of action that helps the drug to become effective is now the secondary mediator. And the organ or the tissue that we are affected is the what? The tertiary mediator. I don't know if I've made it clear. But primary mediators is what elicits the action. So, for example, uh, neurotransmitters, for instance. For example, epinephrine, for instance. For example, growth hormone, for instance. For example, serotonin. So all these are all what? primary messengers. They are all what? primary messengers. Now, example of secondary messengers include cyclic GMP. You can write it down. Cyclic GMP. Two, you can talk about inositol transphosphate. Inositol transphosphate. Trisphosphate. T R I S P H O S P H A. Inositol. I N O S I T O L. They are going to have diacyl glycerol. Diacyl glycerol. D I A C Y L G L Y C E R O N. Diacyl glycerol. Then you can talk about what calcium. You can talk about calcium. You can talk about calcium. So all of these are all what? secondary messengers. Secondary messengers. So from what I've just mentioned, which one of them is not a secondary messenger? Of course, we are talking about glycerol. I've mentioned calcium. I've mentioned inositol. I've mentioned uh, that it's a glycerol. I've mentioned um, cyclic AMP. I've mentioned uh, cyclic GMP as well. So definitely, the one that is not is what glycerol, glycerol, glycerol. The answer is what is A. Sorry, is D. 
All right. We have a four-year-old child with signs of proteinic starvation. Starvation. So you are starving of proteins, 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 proteins. So the signs were as follows: growth inhibition, anemia, edema. Choose the cause of edema formation. So how is edema? So first of all, edema uh, occurs when there is what low oncotic pressure. When there is low oncotic pressure and increased hydrostatic pressure. When we say increased hydrostatic pressure, it means a lot of volume inside the tissue or inside the organ of discussion. A lot of what? Uh, fluid called the hydrostatic pressure. Then we say low oncotic pressure. It means that uh, proteins are not high. So when proteins are not high, what it means is that the substances or the fluid move away. And as a result, what happens? There's edema formation. As a result, they will edema formation. So in this case, the patient is starving. The patient is starving. That means inside the blood vessels, there's no what? Sodium. Sorry, there's no protein. Sorry, sorry. I'm going to put most of the proteins. And usually, the high amount of proteins is what? Of course, proteins are divided. You have the albumins, the globulins, and stuff. So what I'm talking about, no, but the albumins. And the albumins are the highest concentration of, of sodium, of protein, sorry, of proteins. High concentration of, of proteins are the albumins. They are the albumins. So when the albumin is low, it means that fluid will move from the vessels into the tissues. Fluid will move from the vessels into the, the tissue. Don't forget. Oncotic pressure absorbs water. But in the case, oncotic pressure is low because of what? Protein starvation. And what that happens, it means that fluid will move and go to where they are high, and go to where there is high concentration of, of solids or the oncotic pressure. So that's what over here, easily, you can say this is what a reduced syntax of albumins because there is protein starvation. There is what protein starvation, and that is the mechanism of action of this one, edema development. Edema development. If you have any question, just write it down. When we begin with the question, time, please bring it out and I will clarify it for you guys. All right. Now, research is isolated five isoenzyme forms of lactic, lactic dehydrogenase from the human blood serum and studied their properties. Now, what property indicates that the isoenzyme forms were isolated in the same enzyme? Okay, so first of all, isoenzymes, also known as, sorry, isozymes, also means of isoenzymes. And these are enzymes that differ in the amino acid sequence. They differ in amino acid sequence. However, they catalyze the same chemical reaction. They catalyze the same chemical reaction. So it doesn't matter whether we have 20 iso enzymes, they're the same thing. So they will differ in the amino acid, but their reaction will always be the same. That's what over here, your answer should be what? Catalyzation of the same reaction. Catalyzation, because what iso enzyme or isozymes, the same, we're the same people. Okay, let me put it that way. It's just like we have Lucy, we have Esther, we have uh, we have Paul, we have myself. We are all different, but we are all human beings, if I'm correct, of course. Now, assuming I use a needle to prick you, won't you react? Yes, if I pick Paul, Paul will react. If I pick Esther, Esther will react. If I pick uh, uh, Sarah, Sarah will react. If I pick Lucy, she will react. So it's the same thing. So we have the same with reaction, but different with uh, amino acids. But we are the same human beings. So here, your answer is what? The same. Same chemical reaction or same reaction. 
All right. So on some diseases, it is observed aldosteronism. When we say aldosteronism, it means that there's high amount of aldosterone. And when we say aldosterone, we are referring to the sodium. Sodium. And hence, there's a hypertension, of course. When sodium is increased, what it means is that fluid will not be excreted from the body or diuresis will be decreased. So there will be increase in pressure and edema. Good, due to uh -huh, sodium retention in the organism. So what organ is involved in other strong production? Of course, you are thinking about what? Of the adrenal glands. You are thinking of the adrenal glands. So other strong are produced from the adrenal glands. The zona glomerulosa. We have zona glomerulosa. Zona particulata. That's the middle layer. And we have zona reticularis. Where, so reticularis, you are dealing with what? the sex hormones. For the middle layer, you are dealing with, with the cortisol. And from the outer layer, called the glomerulosa, you are dealing with aldosterone. Aldosterone. That is just the So here we are thinking of adrenal glands. Adrenal glands. We have an experiment proved that you being radiated cells of patients with xeroderma uh, pigmentosum restore the native DNA structure slower than cells of healthy individuals as a result of an enzyme. Defection. What enzyme helps this process? What enzyme helps this process? First of all, you know what uh, xeroderma pigmentosum is. It sounds more or less close to what we have already discussed because these people too, they are also allergic to sunlight or they are highly well, sensitive to sunlight. They are sensitive to sunlight. So what happens is that because of their sensitivity to, uh, how do you call it, sunlight, they, their skin needs to go to, or their DNA needs to go to repair because day in and day out, their skin will be going off. So that means that it's good work, a repair. It's good work, a repair. It's good work, a repair. But here is the case. There is a problem, unlike the healthy individuals. The healthy individuals we usually call endonuclease. Endonuclease. But in these people with uh, xeroderma uh, pigmentosum, they have a problem with endonuclease. So, for example, on your skin, like a normal human being on your skin, every day there are two cells. Cells on the apoptosis, and they will die a new cell will will develop apoptosis and die a new cell will, will develop. That process or yeah, it helps, or what helps in those things is what? the endonucleus, is the endonucleus, is the endonucleus. So over here, we're having a problem with, with endonucleus because endonucleus play a role in DNA repair. They play a role in DNA repair. So here, we are thinking of endonucleus, endonucleus. All right. So a patient with suspicion on uh, epidemic typhus, epidemic typhus was administered to the hospital. So we are thinking of uh, arachnids, an incident had been found in his blood. So the question is, what is the career? of the pathogen for epidemic uh, typhus. So first of all, what is a typhus? So typhus is basically, a, so epidemic typhus is just a, a, it's just a form of typhus. It is named because the disease causes an epidemic during war, or it occurs when there's a war or natural disaster. It occurs when there's war or natural disaster. That's what they call it, like epidemic typhus. Epidemic typhus. And it's usually caused by rickettsia. Rickettsia. 
it is caused by the ketin. And of course, it is transmitted by what we call the human body lungs. The human body lungs or pediculus humanus corporis is the same thing. It means the louse on our body. And the plural form of louse is what, of course, lies. So here we are thinking of A as the likely carrier of this rachetia to the carrier of the rachetia, causing this epidemic type, causing the epidemic type. All right. We have a businessman who came to India from South America. On examination, the physician found that the patient was suffering from sleepy sickness. This is a very common question. I mean, common disease because of also no. So we're talking about sleeping uh, sickness. So sleeping sickness, we're talking about trichomyosomiasis. Trichomyosomiasis. And we know it is normally uh, transferred or infected by what? Death the fly. So when a teacher fly bites you, bites you, they carry this uh, trypanosoma. So they will just uh, release it in your system, and that can lead to a sleeping sickness. Sleeping sickness. Sleeping sickness. And of course, this question, you're not actually seeing a uh, teacher fly as an option, but the closest one will be bugs bite. Bugs bite. Okay. But the red answer should be to take a fly. Okay. So here is observed, here is observed inhibited fibrillation in the patient with bowel duct obstruction. Right. They have a bowel duct obstruction. There's bleeding due to low concentration of a vitamin. So what vitamin comes to mind when it comes to bleeding? Of course, you are thinking of vitamin K, vitamin K, vitamin K. So here, we are thinking of vitamin K. Of course, we may mention that uh, ascorbic acid, that's vitamin C, can also help to prevent what? Hemorrhages, bruises, and all those things, all right? Yeah, but over here, there's no even vitamin C to even confuse us so easily. You can go into our vitamin K divisions. Okay. We have a 52 year old with bronchial asthma treated with corticosteroids. Corticosteroids. Bronchial asthma. Bronchial asthma. Corticosteroids. Of course, you know you can treat it with it. Apart from giving the sabotamol and all those things. Fever reaction appeared as a result of post injective abscess. Post injective uh, abscess. Now, the patient had subfibrillar temperature, which did not correspond to the lactic incidentality of inflammatory medication. Why did the patient have low grade fever or low fever reaction? So, first of all, you must know that. During inflammatory processes, cytokines are being produced. Cytokines are being produced. And among them is interleukin 1. Among the cytokines are what? Interleukin 1. And these interleukin 1 are actually responsible for the generation of, uh, how do you call it, temperature. They are actually responsible for the generation of temperature. What do they do? What they do is that they call to call endogenous pyrogen. So they activate the central nervous system. They activate the central nervous system. The hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal axis. But don't confuse yourself. Just know that the thermostat of the brain is in the word hypothalamus. The thermostat is in the hypothalamus. It is controlled by interleukin 1. And interleukin 1 deals with what? Endogenous what? Pyrogenes. Endogenous pyrogenes. So in the case of low-grade fever, it means that 
these interleukin ones were actually what inhibited, or there was what inhibited endogen pyrogen production. Inhibited endogen pyrogen production. When we say pyrogen, pyrogen means what? A microorganism or an infection. Okay, so it is that one that leads to the interleukin one production, and that causes the thermostat to be regulated and causes a high grade temperature. So if that mechanism is inhibited, what happens? It means there will be low grade fever or there will be low fever, fever reaction. That's why over here, quickly, we can go in for, for A as our answer. All right. We had a 35 year old man under the treatment of pulmonary tuberculosis. Guys, again, we have a tuberculosis. And if I remember, we said tuberculosis, what do we do? We give uh, isomizide, we give uh, rifampicin, we give uh, etambutol, then we give what? Uh, parazinamide, parazinamide, parazinamide. But that's not the question. So the, the question is, it has an acute onset of red big protein, swelling and low grade fever. Now, the gouty arthritis, then there's weak acid level will be high. Okay, we'll diagnose that. We'll diagnose and high uric acid was found. So the question now is which of the following antitubercular drugs are known for causing high uric acid? So that is your question. Are known for causing a high uric acid. Already we know that isonizide will cause it will cause uh, 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 neuritis. We already know that isonizer will cause, it, will cause uh, neuritis or eye problems. They will cause what? eye problems. So the question is, so which of the drugs will now lead to these things? And your answer should be what? Pyrazinamide. Pyrazinamide. So paracetamol raises the uric acid levels. They raises the uric acid levels. So here you are thinking of paracetamol, and that's actually the last drug to actually give for people suffering from tuberculosis. People suffering from tuberculosis. So here you are thinking of paracetamol. Okay. You said during metabolic processes, active forms of oxygen, active forms of oxygen, including superoxide anion radical, are formed. What help? See, look at it. With, with, with what help? Can this enzyme be activated? Now we are talking about superoxide. Superoxide. So definitely, we are doing with superoxide what? This motis. So the enzyme that will help it is a superoxide this motis. What it does is that it uh, catalyzes the dismutation of superoxide radical into either ordinary molecular oxygen or hydrogen per oxide, hydrogen peroxide. So basically, your answer should be what? Superoxide dismutase. Superoxide dismutase.